Originally airing in 1987, The Next Generation was the first live-action Star Trek series since the original and it had a high bar to live up to. With time, TNG found its own path and grew its own fanbase. Seven seasons and 178 episodes later, TNG paved the way for the sprawling franchise we know and love today. I am Marcus Bronzy and here are 10 fascinating facts about TNG that only the most hardcore fans might know. Number 10. Stephen Hawking and Star Trek Stephen Hawking was a longtime Star Trek fan. He made a guest appearance in The Descent, the 26th episode of the sixth season, becoming the first and only actor to play himself. In this episode, Data played poker with the holographic version of the famed scientist. Over the years, Stephen Hawking played himself in various guest appearances in shows like Futurama and The Big Bang Theory, but TNG was a highlight for him. Early that year, whilst at Paramount, he asked to tour the TNG set. Hawking spoke about how he requested to sit in the captain's chair and that it was quite Quote, rather more comfortable and a lot more powerful than his wheelchair. He made it clear he would be open to a guest appearance and the writers made it happen. Data actor Brent Spiner has spoken about how filming the scenes with him is one of his favourite memories from TNG. Number 9. Gene Roddenberry was a volatile visionary Gene Roddenberry was the visionary behind Star Trek, but according to an interview with Gerald Roddenberry, also struggled with substance abuse issues and increasingly was difficult to work with. The documentary Chaos on the Bridge discusses how Roddenberry initially did not want another Star Trek show. When he realised Paramount was serious about proceeding with TNG, he feared not being involved. Roddenberry had strong ideas about how stories should be told, and during the development of TNG, Roddenberry relied on his lawyer to uphold his vision at all times. Writers felt stifled by the constant rewrites asked of them. One of Roddenberry's rules for the show was that there should not be major conflict amongst the crewmates unless there was some outside force affecting their character. The ideas of an always perfect future without any character conflicts further ostracised those working on the show. After Roddenberry passed, those involved worked hard to keep his vision alive, but they also had more freedom to explore stories that might not have been approved. Number 8. Georgie LaForge's Painful Visor Georgie LaForge was chief engineering officer. Born blind, Geordie wears a visor which lets him see across the electromagnetic spectrum. In Encounter at Farpoint, viewers learn that the visor can be painful for Geordie because of how it conflicts with his natural senses. The reality for actor LeVar Burton wasn't too far off from that of the character he played. The visor prop was initially conceived by Michael Akuda, who was inspired by a banana hair clip. The distinctive teeth of the popular hair accessory inspired the shape and pattern of the rods of the visor. It looked cool, but the tiny gaps between the rods made it very difficult for Burton to see. When Practicing before filming, Burton would wear sunglasses to give the feeling of Georgie's costume whilst allowing the actor to move around freely. During filming, Burton found himself bumping into tables, tripping over cords, all due to the visor that was supposed to be giving the character sight. Ironic. After the first season, the visor was redesigned, but it didn't make things easier for Burton. The visor was made to be heavier and was designed to screw onto Burton's temples. This kept it secure, but also caused terrible headaches. In describing the experience of acting with the visor, Burton said it was pretty much a living hell. Number 7. Star Trek Phase 2 Inspired Characters in TNG in 1977, 10 years before TNG would air, Paramount announced a new Star Trek series, Star Trek Phase 2. Phase 2 was planned to reunite most of the original cast with new characters. Eventually, the series was dropped, but three of the new characters from Phase 2 ended up being reimagined for Star Trek The Next Generation. Ilea, a Delta navigator who could sense emotions, eventually became Deanna Troy. Her Phase 2 love interest, Willa Decker, became Will Riker. The third character who helped shape TNG was originally written as as a Vulcan. In Phase 2, Spock was to be replaced by Zon, a full-blooded Vulcan. Unlike Spock, who grew up with a human mother, Zon would have been even more socially ignorant of his human companions. With little to no understanding of human emotions, Zon would have chosen to embrace the emotions within himself that his culture repressed. The decision was made that TNG should not heavily reference the original series, at least not until it had established itself as a show in its own right, but they still wanted to have an outsider character who struggled with human culture and went on a personal journey to understand human emotions. Instead of having a Vulcan character, the decision was made to have an android, giving us the well-beloved Data. Number 6. Costume Troubles 
We've done a whole video on this, but here's a few extra facts. TNG introduced the new uniforms that were meant to invoke similar feeling to the original series. When possible, no buttons, zippers or pockets were visible. Not being able to see how the clothing fastened was part of the sci-fi aesthetic. In the original series, uniforms were initially made out of velour, but the fabric ripped easily and couldn't survive dry cleaning. By the third season, the switch was made to nylon. TNG had a similar struggle with fabric. Initially, spandex was used for the uniforms, but it was uncomfortable for the actors. The problem with spandex is that it retains heat and also odours. The lack of lengthwise stretch also caused back pain in many of the actors. Patrick Stewart's chiropractor actually told him 15 hour shoots in the uniform were going to do permanent damage. He even said he should sue. In season 3, TNG switched their uniforms to wool, less painful but more difficult to move in. Eventually, the decision was made to retain the fabric but switch the men's uniforms into a two-piece jumpsuit which allowed more range of motion. Ocean. Marina Sirtis and Gates McFadden had to continue to suffer through their uncomfortable, more form-fitting version of the design with added pressure to maintain their weight. One of the lasting legacies of all of those costume troubles was something that became known as the Picard Maneuver. The maneuver Stuart would make to adjust his uniform so that it wouldn't bunch your ride up. Number 5. Troy. Four breasts and other struggles. Deanna Troy's character was inspired by Aaliyah from Phase 2. Aaliyah is a Delton and came from a culture that was so sexual that they must swear an oath of celibacy to join Starfleet. The first go at Troy's character retained this element of hypersexuality. Roddenberry envisioned Troy as a wanton, four-breasted hermaphrodite. However, writer Dorothy Fontana argued that it was a character everyone was going to find offensive. As detailed in Gene Roddenberry, The Myth and the man behind Star Trek, Fontana added, Do you know how much trouble women have with the normal number? Keeping them out of the way of things? I mean, four, straight up and down? <laughs> Don't be silly. So the boobs were out the window, but Troy did retain Ilya's gift of being an empath, which ended up creating some issues for actress Marina Sirtis. The character's powers were expansive and poorly defined to the point where new writers were hesitant to write her character into scripts at all. On top of that, Roddenberry felt that there were too many women on the show at the time. Marina Sirtis was worried that she might be fired. These were not idle fears. In an interview with AV Club, Sirtis said that Major Roddenberry confirmed her character had been on the chopping block, but going into the second season, a lot had changed. Gene Roddenberry let Sirtis know that the first episode of the second season would be about Troy. Her response was to burst into tears. In her own words, basically, I've been hanging on by my fingernails for a whole season, not just professionally, but emotionally. Number 4. Open Submissions in 1989, TNG decided to try something a little bit different. They began to accept unsolicited scripts from amateur writers. The official policy was anyone could send in up to two scripts. Afterwards, they would need an agent to get their eyes on their work. TNG received over 10,000 submissions, but only a handful were accepted. One of the most famous spec scripts that made it on air was Yesterday's Enterprise. The original script by Trent Christopher Ganino was the starting point. It was then sent to be reworked by in-house writers. The writers ended up up having to work over Thanksgiving weekend in order to get it finished in time for filming. In an interview about this, writer Ira Stephen Burr said, that peed everyone off to no end, but that was the job. The hard work was worth it, and the creative original idea became the base of a well-regarded episode. In the end, Paramount decided that the open submission policy was more of a risk than it was worth. They were having issues with people claiming plagiarism and suing, but in the years it existed, some bright new writers got their break. Number 3. The Borg were almost bugs. Originally, TNG planned to have the Ferengi as the big bad for the show, filling a role similar to the Romulans or the Klingons in the original series. This was short-lived for a good reason, but it also left a place in the universe for a much-needed antagonist for the series. Maurice Hurley came up with the initial idea for the Borg, an alien species that was insect-like in appearance, but the budget for such a design was too much for the show, so they decided to go with a cyborg creature instead. Costume designer Dorinda Rice Wood talked about the process of designing the visuals for the Borg, saying, I was tired of the futuristic, clean, stainless steel imagery of the time. I was more interested in texture, the ugliness of humanity and the ugliness of nature. The idea was that they would be half human and half mechanical. Their body parts would wear out and they would replace them with mechanical parts. So I wanted to make all of the mechanical parts different and unique for each person. The final version of the Borg was no longer bug-like in appearance, but they did have similarities with the original idea. For example, the Borg Collective, which was built on the idea of an insect-like hive mind. Added elements like the Borg absorbing other races into their consciousness gave a frightening edge to these new villains. Number 2. Guinan would not exist without Whoopi Goldberg 
Whoopi Goldberg was a longtime Star Trek fan. When she was nine years old, she saw her first episode of Star Trek, and as she put it, I went screaming through the house, calling for her family to come and see what was on TV. There's a black lady on the television, and she ain't no maid. Seeing Uhura was very inspiring for the soon to be actress. When TNG first started airing, Whoopi Goldberg was a household name. She'd recently starred in The Color Purple, and she'd won a Golden Globe. She asked for LeVar Burton for help convincing Gene Roddenberry to give her a chance, but no one contacted her. When Denise Crosby, who played Tasha, left TNG, Goldberg thought this might mean the show would be interested in adding a new female character, so the actress took it upon herself to reach out and see. Turns out, the reason no one had contacted her was because they couldn't believe that a movie star like Whoopi Goldberg was actually interested. Eventually, Roddenberry and Rick Berman met up with the actress, but were confused as to why this big-name star wanted to be part of their little thing called Star Trek. She told them, I have watched science fiction my whole life, and Star Trek is the only time that I ever saw black people people in the future. Soon after, Goldberg joined the cast as the bartender and, the only thing that Q seemed afraid of, Guinan. Number 1. Patrick Stewart wasn't Roddenberry's first pick the idea of what kind of character the new captain should be was already a debate while developing TNG. According to the documentary Chaos on the Bridge, execs thought that they should be played in a similar way to Captain Kirk. Why change this winning formula? Well, Roddenberry wanted a distinct and new kind of captain, agreeing with the writer David Gerald that it should be a slightly older captain this time. Still, when Patrick Stewart tried out bringing a unique feel to the character, Roddenberry was not convinced. Gene disagreed with producer Robert Justman, who thought Stewart was perfect for the role. In a recent interview with The Hollywood reporter, Stewart said, There is, somewhere in the sellers of Paramount Pictures, a post-it note which says, I do not want to hear Patrick Stewart's name mentioned again ever, signed Gene Roddenberry. Once he did get the part, Stewart didn't feel that Roddenberry truly embraced him as a character. He spoke of how when Roddenberry was on set, sometimes he would stare at Stewart with an expression on his face saying, what the is this guy doing in my show? Despite the controversy over whether or not he should be hired, Stewart proved himself, bringing to life the iconic character and shaping the Star Trek history in the process. So there you go, 10 Star Trek TNG facts you probably didn't know. And if you did know, well done for you. How many out of these 10 did you know? Let us know in the comments below. Also, if you like this vid, feel free to give us a like and a subscribe. You can also follow Trek Culture on Twitter. I too am on Instagram, Twitter and TikTok at Marcus Bronzy. And my podcast, How to Kill an Hour, is out wherever you listen to those. Until next time, stay blessed.